There are believed to be 250 million working children in the world today, a third of them in India. For decades, there have been calls for the abolition of child labor. This film is about a child's right to work. Working children are organizing themselves and joining unions. They're prepared to stand up to authority and they're wanting control over their lives. The rag pickers of Delhi are unlikely trend setters, but they are setting a pattern for child workers in India. You may not have heard of them. There have been no international campaigns to free them from factories making designer trainers or jeans. Their product is rubbish. And yet these, the children working in the informal sector, are the majority. Suraj has been a rag picker since he was nine. Other kids taught me what to pick, cardboard, tin and iron. When I began selling it, I got money, so I thought about it and decided to carry on. I didn't want to depend on anyone. I wanted to stand on my own two feet, and so that's why I started. There are more than 100,000 child rag pickers in Delhi, Many have fled drunken and abusive parents or left home simply because there were too many mouths to feed. It's the kind of work that encourages a keen sense of injustice and awareness of the advantages of sticking together. The day's spoils are sorted and weighed by a middleman on whose mood they depend for survival. People shout at us and chase us away. When we sell the rubbish we collect, they always give us 20 rupees, even when it's worth 30. They claim our rubbish has waste in it, and so that's how we get cheated. We can just about afford to buy tea and bread. When we work, the police try to stop us, but with child labor, it's not as if anyone else is going to feed us, so we have to work. They grab meals on the curbside and sleep in skips and on the roofs of tin shacks, and these are the lucky ones. The boys attend a street school for a couple of hours a day, organized by Butterflies, one of the few local charities prepared to educate working children. They know that without being able to read or write, the rest of their lives will be spent rag picking. I come here to study because I want to read and write so people can't lie to me and cheat me. I want to learn maths and start a business. I'm studying so that I'll be able to make something of my life. Between shifts, more than a thousand working children attend these schools, scattered through the slums of Delhi. Without a fixed address, they're not allowed in to the government schools. And anyway, attending formal school wouldn't leave enough time to work. At independence 54 years ago, India pledged to provide universal primary education within 12 years. Today, while the government spends more on weapons than education, 
some 55 million children don't go to school. It was at the street school that the boys met other child workers, shared their problems and decided to form a union. Butterflies has rented space for them in one of the night shelters for Delhi's down and outs. They make a commitment not to take drugs, to look after one another and to tackle issues like lack of health care and police harassment. There are so many of us living on the streets without the right to study or play, so we have to work. Everybody tries to stop us. That's why we formed the union to hold rallies and get our rights. These children don't want to work. They're saying, if we have to, let's get together and try and improve our lives. To outsiders, the idea may look ambitious, even absurd. But like Gandhi's Quit India campaign, by questioning the prevailing norms in India, the exploitation and abuse, it could have potential. It's new and more in touch with working children's needs than many other efforts to help them. Over the years, hundreds of outside agencies and journalists have had a go at the problem with little success. I've done my bit, using a hidden camera to get into factories and find working children. I've cooperated with NGOs in filming raids and we've congratulated ourselves on liberating young workers, too dazed to yet realize their luck. And we've criticized those who allow these practices to continue. Despite the promise by the authorities a year ago to tighten up on the restrictions governing the employment of under 14 year olds, the practice appears to be as widespread and sophisticated as ever. But these campaigns always target high-profile export goods, which may allow Western consumers to sleep more easily at night, but account for only 5% of the workforce. As I later discovered, the liberated children all too often end up in even more dangerous industries. Because there are no fancy brand names here, they're ignored. Perhaps we should have asked the children. Organizations like the South Asia Coalition Against Child Servitude are still carrying out these raids. SACS is totally against child labor because we believe that if children are allowed to work, we make sure that they will remain illiterate, they will remain poor, and they will cause uh, unemployment among adults. The silk industry of Karnataka in southwest India is, I believe, a classic example of why raids don't work. They don't tackle the real problem. Ten years ago, the World Bank committed some 20 million pounds to develop the industry. Demand for cheap and obedient child workers soared. Up to 7,000 children were soon working on the looms until the local press got wind of it and the local government promised to act. Shelters were set up to rehabilitate the workers. Girls as young as six told how they'd been made to stand and work for up to 12 hours a day and beaten if they faltered. The World Bank was embarrassed and UNICEF funded local NGOs to help. But today, two years after the scandal, only a hundred or so have been rescued. Thousands of children are still working. Carla, who's 11, was made to live in a factory for three years. She was rescued only a few days ago and reunited with her family. Is she happy to be free? Yes, I want to study. And life in the factory? 
I had to stand from 8.30 every morning until 9 at night. We were allowed an hour for lunch. We had to cook it and eat the same food five times. They beat us if we tried to throw it away because it was off. If people came to inspect, they told us to hide. Otherwise, they'd take us away, take our kidneys out and gouge out our eyes. It's called bonded labour and the practice continues. Parents borrow money from the factory owners, the only credit available, who in turn keep their daughters working until the debt is paid off. Saroja runs one of the NGOs set up to help. Here she's trying to persuade three girls who are still bonded to escape. But why should they run the risk? After all, the government has appointed inspectors whose job is to go into the factories and free child workers. He is going, but he is not uh, uh, taking any interest to release the children. Just he is going, wherever he saw the children, he is taking bribe from the employers. So the inspectors Empire, are going into the factories, yes, but they are accepting yes, bribes yes, and they are not releasing the children. Yes, employers uh, themselves telling with us, he is taking per month 500 rupees. That uh, uh, inspector is taking every month 500 rupees. Still today is also he is doing that. Saraja asked me to see if the police would help. They arranged an impressive reception committee, but that was the extent of their activity. I pointed out that the local police are part of the task force set up to rescue the child factory workers and asked whether they could release the three girls we'd met earlier that day. The employers will already have removed the girls and ordered their parents to deny they took a loan or sent the child to the factory. So you're saying that the employers are always one step ahead of you? Yes, by the time the news reaches us, the employers will have got rid of the children. They're always ahead of us. The whole town knows what's going on. Young girls can be seen getting off buses at 7 in the morning and walking to work. The factory owners prefer to get the younger ones, like Carla, to sleep on the factory floor. If you approach the girls, they've been told to run and to regard all strangers with fear and suspicion. False birth certificates are on sale in town, and if you ask one how old she is, she's been taught to say that she doesn't know. All the publicity and moral outrage about working children doesn't worry these employers. There are no well-known brand names here, and no one's going to bother them. Children are cheaper and easier to employ than their parents, who would demand better pay and conditions. Costs are kept low, and the foreign investors are kept happy. World Bank money is still coming in, and there's no hesitation about telling me to get lost. But if you have no children in there, what's the problem? Those in charge like to shift the blame. The state government say they've done their bit and put the fault with the parents. I think we have removed maximum children from that area. We are booking cases and we are uh, punishing the employer and we are uh, um, warning the parents that you also will be punished. Parents are not giving cooperation. The minister is right. It is the fault of the parents. Parents say that if they could get well-paid work, they wouldn't send their children to the factories. Carla's mother and father make garlands, which earn them 60 pence a day. Not enough to survive on, let alone pay for the dowries for three daughters. There's mixed feelings about Carla's release. I have to think that it's good for her future, but how can we face our future? That's the problem. 
When we think of her future, we say, yes, let her study. But if she had kept working, she would have brought us an income of 250 rupees, and that would have looked after us as well. Now Carla's employer wants him to pay back the loan. I can't see a way out. I can't argue with her employer because he'll cause more trouble. We'll have to leave the village and kill ourselves. Sarasa, now 16 and a young activist, started work at six and speaks with more authority than most adults on the subject. No parents who have proper jobs ever consider sending their children out to work. But without work, they have no choice. Employers don't employ parents, so parents are jobless and have to rely on their children to earn money. Government blaming the parents won't solve the problem because the real problem isn't being recognised. Parents are not the true reason for child labour. Like the rag pickers of Delhi, children here in Bangalore are losing faith in the adult agencies which are charged with their protection and are concluding that their only hope lies in organizing themselves. Sarasa is now president of a working children's collective which covers eight of Bangalore's many slums. Like the boys, after comparing notes on their working lives, they decided that they'd benefit by getting together. When I was rescued from working, I was able to get all the reports and records about other working children's problems. This gave me confidence because I had also suffered as a child. I felt that the only way to get our rights was by campaigning. After realising that this is the only way that we can argue for our rights, we all joined together and decided to have our own association. The collective is made up mainly of girl domestic workers. They say they could tolerate the hours put in cleaning the houses of the rich who live on the other side of the tracks, if only there was not so much to do at home. In all, their tasks add up to a 14-hour day. A working day which is dominated by water. It's three o'clock in the morning and the girls are at the slum water tap. The water comes on any time between three and five o'clock and it runs for a couple of hours and only every other day. So you have to be there or you'll miss your place in the queue. After two or three trips from the tap back home with the heavy containers, tempers get frayed and, Manjula explains, fights break out. Fights like this shouldn't happen. The quarrels around here always end up with people smashing the water pipe. Then we have to go without water for three or four days until they come and patch it up with cement. It's always the pipe that gets smashed. It takes the brunt of all the arguments around here. The working day of Manjula's neighbour, Saraswati, is typical of the girls in the slum. I fetch the water, do the washing up, prepare breakfast, sweep and wipe the floor, eat, go to work over in the apartments where I start washing the pots again.
We need the water, so we have to get it. But we shouldn't have to get it so early in the morning. We too need rest and sleep. It's nine o'clock, and after six hours of collecting water and cleaning at home, it's time to go to work. The road they cross from the slum leads them to a world of wealth, abuse and intimidation. The children are cheap to hire, and there are plenty of them. Like the silk factory owners, those who've become rich on Bangalore's computer revolution prefer to employ children rather than their parents. While I was working, they kept burning me on various places on my body. They threw hot oil on my face and told me not to tell anybody. They said that if I told anyone, they would stab me with a knife. Employers take full advantage of the poverty in the slum across the road. The girls daren't complain. There's always someone else ready to take their job, even at two pounds a week. They ordered me to do extra jobs, and when I asked for 50 rupees more, someone else came and offered to do the job for less than me and told them to get rid of me, so I was sacked. With the work, the intimidation and the problems in the slum, it's remarkable that the girls have the energy left to try and change their lives. One of their targets is the mains water pipe, which doubles as a bridge for those who are lucky enough to leave the slum every day and go to the school on the other side. But it's potentially lethal. Every year, children fall and drown. It's issues like this which concern the children in the collective. It's as if their parents have been defeated by their hostile environment and given up. So it's not the adults, but the children who go to the water board to complain. It's two o'clock when they arrive at the second address. The notice here says that complaints from the slum will be dealt with between one and four, but the office is closed. They're told to return the next day. Never once have they approached us as working children to ask us directly about our problems. They're more concerned with newspaper headlines than with real achievements. If they were genuinely motivated, they would have asked about our association, found out about working children's problems, looked into them and allowed us to help in finding solutions. The government doesn't ask us anything because they don't want to hear the truth. The girls, like the boys in Delhi, know that education is the way to escape. They too don't have time to go to a formal school, but in another example of their collective wisdom, they make sure that others do. Some of us from the union went from house to house and spoke to the parents and said to them that if they didn't send their children to school, 
they'd end up like us, having to wash pots and scrub floors and unable to recognise their own bus route numbers. We managed to persuade some of the children and took them to school, where they are doing well learning to read and write. They'll benefit, and we'd like to learn like that too. The girls managed to round up 68 children and get them to go to the local government school. Sumitra can only look on in envy. I too should go to school. I must learn to read. I can't do numbers at all. And I should learn to write, that's all. When Saraswati joined a tailoring class, she too felt embarrassed and humiliated by her lack of education. They asked me to write my name. I said I didn't know how to write. A little girl who was there said, Can't you write? How can you come here and learn how to sew? I can't even read bus numbers. I just go and stand there and hope for the best. The girls do now attend an informal evening school two nights a week. A local charity, APSA, which supports the Children's Union, pays for the teacher. For Saraswati, it's been a life-changing experience. Going to school has been good for me. I was very stressed, and now I'm much happier. It has taught me how to share and to be more relaxed. If the children from the union put pressure on the adults in the government, they may start to take some notice of us. I have a belief that something will happen if we keep asking and keep up the pressure. In Delhi, home to the ministries of social justice and child welfare, they told me that the government is doing very well in looking after all the children of India, thank you, though it could still do with more outside help. International NGOs like UNICEF told me they're still targeting the well-known brand names where they know they can make an impact. They say they believe in the gradual approach and that tackling the informal sector, where most children work, is too difficult. And local organisations believe that the formation of working children's unions is a dangerous trend. When the children form the unions uh, with the initiative of someone else, they accept that the child labour is a reality, it's a necessity, and it will continue. It's absolutely pessimistic. If these children don't work, how would they feed themselves? How can they stop working? They should be allowed to work. If not, they'll starve to death. But boys like Anuj, who's been rag-picking for four years, say that their very presence appears to offend people who attack them for being thieving layabouts and refuse to see them as children, desperate to survive. When we rag-pick, people hit us. They don't let us rag-pick. And then when we get hurt, we get annoyed and humiliated. After all, Whatever we do when we used to buy food. We ask ourselves, 
What kind of life is this? The boys in Delhi who've been learning to read and write believe that if only people understood them, they'd get more sympathy. Hence the weekly editorial meeting to discuss their newspaper. Anuj is the editor. The reason we do this is that we're all poor. We have this paper because when one of us has an accident or dies, the big newspapers won't report it. That's why we report it, so that we can tell people about us as well. We stick the papers up on a wall so that people have to read it and they realise that children have rights too. We have no other way of being heard. The paper is published as a wall poster requiring buckets of homemade glue. The distribution process must wait for nightfall when the police, not the natural supporters of youthful enthusiasm, let alone social reform, are less likely to be about. Butterflies provides the bus to take the group to the poster hanging areas of Delhi and it begins to look and sound like a schoolboy's outing. They set to work furiously and with urgency. They persuade themselves that if only people can get to read our paper and about our problems, surely they'll understand why we have to work. It's a monthly ritual. Sometimes they get away with it, this time they don't. I'm afraid I don't remain an impartial observer. The boys persist, and so do the police. Challenged this time by one of the street educators, who accompany the boys to help them if there's trouble. <laughs> Wherever the boys turn, authority appears to panic at the sight of children asserting their rights. <laughs> Every other political party, every other organization is allowed to hang war posters up in Delhi. Why not the children? Probably only because we're here, the police back off. Before, we never used to be able to voice our problems and ideas. We thought no one would listen to us, and anyway, we were too frightened to actually say anything. So we joined the paper group, and the street educator explained to us that we shouldn't be so afraid. And so after we discussed this idea, we felt empowered. So now we have somewhere to voice our concerns. There is somewhere we can publish our thoughts, whereas before we couldn't do that. They finish putting up their paper at 4.30 in the morning. A couple of hours later, they're back at work. By belonging to the union, by facing hostile encounters with the police together, they're acquiring the confidence to tackle problems which arise with adults at work. Amin is back collecting plastic bottles from drains for recycling. Last August, we faced a really serious problem. The porters in the station were hitting us and chasing us away. Even the police took their side. Nobody stood up for us. 
Then we began to discuss what we could do about this at our meetings, because if we are prevented from working, we'll have even bigger problems. Afterwards, we did manage to meet with the representatives of the porters. That's the advantage of having joined the union. The children went to the meeting with the porters as a group, and Nuj was with them. We said to them, look, we are children and we also want to work like you. It's not as if we're taking work away from you. You have your work and we have ours. We're not stealing your jobs. We're only doing our share of the work. So because of that meeting, things have improved a bit. It's not that we like child labour, but at least being in the union makes our lives a little better. <laughs> The porters and the police have now backed down. Now I can study and think for myself how to better my life. I can see the change in myself. I have overcome my fear of the police and we can even speak to them now. But however much the boys argue that they're only getting together in order to improve their lives, the abolitionists maintain that there's something sinister in the child collective. The so-called children's unions put huge amount of money, huge amount of manpower, huge amount of efforts to form those so-called unions. There are some other masterminds behind it. There are some NGOs, there are some people who feel that they, they, they can start some romanticism on the question of child labour. It is us who face the problems because we live and work on the streets 24 hours a day. The teachers only come for a few hours. The rest of the time, we have to solve our problems on our own. If only the two sides could get together and talk. But the children and those who seek to help them are now more alone than ever. The UK charity Christian Aid has just cut funding to the Butterflies organization because they say it condones child labor. And yet these children argue, if only people would listen to us rather than judge us, we know what the problem is, as we've been saying all along. There are so many children working and feeding themselves on the streets. If you really want to abolish child labour, give their parents a decent job. If parents had work, they'd never send their children out to work. After a year of negotiation, butterflies have managed to get Anuj and Raju admitted to the local government school. One of the problems had been that the boys had no fixed address, but the school was persuaded to accept the night shelter as home. The two do a full school day and then rag pick in order to feed themselves and to pay for the shelter. For two rupees a night, it gives them a concrete floor to sleep on, a locker in which to keep their school books, and the electricity to do their homework by. Grappling with figures is a key part of their plans for the future. At the monthly meeting of their microcredit bank, they hear that at last they've been given the funds to start banking operations. Amin and Suraj have a plan. They're the first to apply for a grant under the scheme. Suraj 
The boys have noted the long queues of Delhi rickshaw drivers waiting for fuel. From this year, all rickshaws must run on natural gas, and there's a supply problem. These will be their future customers. The boys plan to take a loan from the Union Bank for a year and keep the rag picking and bottle collecting going until the tea business becomes viable. Their latest enterprise is their BBC, Butterflies Broadcasting Children, a mobile roadshow and other means of promoting the cause. The union has made us realise that we working children should also be able to live decently. Nobody can harass us, so my self-confidence and that of the other kids has been boosted by this. There's been a good turnout. People are listening to them. They return elated, only to be thwarted by adult authority again. The only place they can call home, the shelter which Butterflies has been renting for them, has been closed without warning. They're not even allowed to come back in to collect their school books for the next day. Why is it you're turning the children out? They have nowhere else to sleep. We are not authorized from our officer to give you any interview. There was only two hours notice given. As a human being, just tell me, is this reasonable notice? <laughs> At present, I am not a human being. I am, a, I am government employee. If the government officials who have such power over the lives of working children deny that they're human beings, you begin to ask what hope there is that anyone will listen to them. They've convinced me that they know the solution. Stop attacking us, they're saying, but attack the poverty which destroys our families. Let us work so long as our survival depends on it but give us the education and the help we need to change our lives. Meanwhile, we won't give up. We'll carry on with working and with our dreams. Sue Lloyd Roberts will be live online tomorrow at 3.30 p.m. You can email her your questions now at correspondent at bbc.co.uk. New rulers enter Kabul as the Taliban flee. On the 2nd of December, correspondent reports from Afghanistan on the return of the Mujahideen, a decade after they first seized power. Then their rule ended in civil war. What now for this troubled nation? <laughs>